Welcome to the University of Illinois Extension's Local Government Education Platform. I'm Nancy Wadrago, State Specialist in Community and Economic Development, and we are happy to bring this program, Central Illinois Cultural Assets, Mapping Resources, People, and Meaning to Propel Community and Economic Vitality. We're happy to bring this to you today in partnership with the University of Illinois College of Fine and Applied Arts and the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. Um, and we are featuring a project that is sponsored by these partners, um, as well as by the University of Illinois Office of Provost Investment for Growth Program. Our presenters today are Dr. Jennifer Novak Leonard, uh, research uh, uh, and associate professor of fine and applied arts with the University of Illinois, as well as Dr. Andrew Greenlee, Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Illinois, and Emma Walters, Research Assistant in Fine and Applied Arts and Urban and Regional Planning with the University of Illinois. And then I'm going to post their bios in the chat for time's sake, but let me just say that we are so very grateful for the time and expertise you've given, the amazing work that you've done over the last few years in Central Illinois, and within your role as faculty who are engaged in state outreach. Um, I will now turn it over to Dr. Novak Leonard. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, for having us and to all of you for joining us this morning. It's a real pleasure to have this opportunity, um, your time and energy to engage in this topic with you. Um, Andrew, do you mind advancing the slide? Thank you so much. Um, Nancy briefly already introduced our team, so to save time, we're not going to expand on that, but here are our faces our con and our contact information. So we'll be, you can certainly reach out with the questions if they occur to you following this conversation today. And we um, hope that you will indeed reach out to us. Um, so this has been um, the core team throughout this two-year project now. Um, Andrew, do you mind advancing? Thank you so much. Um, and again, we want to express our sincere thanks to Extension that made this project possible not only with financial support, but certainly in terms of collaboration and exchange and dialogue throughout the process to ensure that um, it, uh, we could expand it and make it um, as robust as possible. So we're incredibly grateful for that. Um, and additionally, um, as Nancy also already mentioned, but I want to express a thank you to the College of Fine and Applied Arts um, and particularly the Arts Impact Initiative, which is funded by the Office of the Provost. Uh, this college-wide initiative uh, really looks at a lot of the different ways in the social mediums around arts and cultural exchange in terms of policy and practice. Um, and this is one of the projects within that larger umbrella. So we thank them for their support and encourage you to, to um, check out some of the other work that's underway as well throughout the college with various partners. Um, so today's project, we specifically have four goals that we uh, set out and embarked on at the beginning of our work. First and namely, to really look at how could, is it possible to foster reflection and connection, specifically working within Peoria's uh, cultural ecosystem in order to both elicit and identify strengths and opportunities in conversation and with the reflection of individuals who are living and working there and who value the cultural ecosystem. Um, and Secondly, to really see with that process and engaging in these reflections and these points of connection, the ways to increase the visibility for the broad range of creative and cultural activity and the diversity contained within the local arts and creative ecosystem, both to identify ways and means to identify potential capacity to collaborate, points of possible coordination and um, collection and also different perspectives that are being brought to things that are evolving within that have evolved certainly that are being propelled and being very forward looking. So how can we, in this process, expand visibility for the diversity and range um, within the local community, arts and cultural community? Thirdly, um, extrapolating from our work directly with uh, Peoria residents um, and stakeholders, thinking about how can we best understand this model that we undertook to be able to adapt it as a process that may be taken up by other communities who are interested in similar work? So we'll engage uh, in that with a focus on process um, throughout our conversation today. Um, and fourthly, ultimately at the end of this, to provide research informed community-based assets um, that would be useful to Peoria and as learning tools for the um, other communities who may be interested in taking up such work. 
specifically geospatial maps, which are quite traditionally thought of in terms of when we think about asset mapping, but to expand upon that um, with videos and other means of reporting. And we'll get into much more detail on these matters as we proceed. Um, so we're going to work to cover a lot today, uh, but I encourage you to visit the website, the Arts Impact Initiative, the Arts Impact, uh, .faa .illinois .edu, um is a broad uh, uh, initiative, and then specifically the, the page with additional resources that we'll be touching on throughout our conversation today. And we'll show these out sites uh, at, at the end of the, our conversation as well. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to kind of split our time today covering the process, um, as well as covering the products and the insights that we garnered and created uh, throughout this process. And I'm going to turn it over now for my colleagues, Andrew Greenley, excuse me, Andrew Greenley and Emma Walters to go into much greater depth on each of these topics. And we're aiming to reserve about 15 minutes and I'm at the end of our conversation today for questions. All right, Jennifer, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us uh, this morning. Again, my name is Andrew Greenlee, and I'll talk a little bit about the uh, process that we went through. Uh, as Nancy mentioned in her introduction, this has been around a uh, two year uh, process now just a little bit uh, more than that. Um, and we thank you indeed for, uh, to extension for understanding our need for just a little bit more time to to finish things up. Um, our process really started um, in a very traditional sense, you know, oftentimes when you think of uh, community asset maps, you might think of the collection of existing secondary data. And indeed, that is where we started our process, simply looking at um, the types of existing information that might help us to represent um, community assets, especially those related to arts and culture in Peoria. Parallel to that process, however, we started to uh, develop close relationships with the community and then transition into doing more uh, interview uh, work within the community. Um, and then from there, expanded out into doing focus groups. And then finally, we're at the point where we're sharing the results of that. And I'll talk a little bit more in just a moment about the theory as to how all these pieces fit together. Um, the main concept uh, and idea that we're working on here is that, um, you know, asset maps, like so many other plans and, and, and documents, are really only so good as the engagement and the investment that community members have in them and the process through which they are created. And so our goal here, um, as and we'll talk about in a, a few minutes, is to use these multiple forms of engagement and using video um, as a way to capture them um, becomes a way to create not just a shared community resource, but also a process that creates momentum on continuing and sustaining the conversation um, even after our portion of the process concludes. So a very important group for us in the early stages of the process and ongoing throughout this process has been our local advisory group. And that group has really been involved in steering and shaping the project, helping us to articulate the vision um, of what the project uh, can be and how it would be most relevant and useful to the local community, to bring their local knowledge to the uh, process of scoping questions and thinking about our strategy, to bring connections to community members and institutions, to connect us with local resources, and likewise to help us reflect as we've gone along in the process. And you can see the names of our local advisory group members here. Um, our main goal was to have uh, diversity and representation from a wide range of different sectors and perspectives in Peoria. Um, what was really crucial for us to identify and uh, develop um, our understanding of what that diversity might be was our partnership with Extension, in particular uh, Nancy, uh, but also I think it's important to acknowledge the extensive work that um, Kathy Brown, uh, who uh, has now retired from Extension and who then actually came on board as one of our local advisory group members. Um, it's important that we acknowledge the extensive role that she also played in helping us to uh, ensure we had diversity of representation 
representation across a wide variety of uh, sectors and perspectives in establishing that local advisory group. So thanks to them for really helping us to guide uh, this work and to continuing to be important shepherds um, and stewards of this work as we're concluding our, um, our contribution to it. In terms of uh, the information we collected, um, we did outreach and engagement to around 150 um, local individuals and organizations in Peoria, um, ultimately ended up interviewing uh, around 51 uh, individuals from a wide variety of sectors, and then also held multiple focus groups in Peoria. And I'll talk a little bit again about how those focus groups articulate with the remainder of our process in just a minute. And um, again, also thank you to some of the groups that helped us to host these events. Um, art Partners, the Peoria Symphony Orchestra and Peoria Art Guild, Contemporary Art Center of Peoria, the Riverfront Museum and St. Paul's Episcopal Church, um, who all played really important roles in helping to host us as we were facilitating these community conversations. And so here's uh, a list with their permission of the individuals who we uh, ended up interviewing and uh, talking with as part of our community asset mapping process. So what I'll do now is actually switch and talk a little bit more about some of the things that we learned from this process. And you're seeing images here from our final community guide. This is something that um, is on the Arts Impact website and that, um, that basically reflects some of our learning. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned early on, in terms of our goals for the overall project, one of those goals was to create a model which other communities might be able to adapt to their own circumstances and use. And so this community guide is designed to capture some of what we learned through the process so that other communities might consider adapting the strategy for some of their own community asset mapping or other forms of community engagement. So um, just uh, again, an understanding this is on our website and uh, publicly accessible uh, for you at this time. So uh, I'm just going to show some of the, the screenshots from this. Um, so you kind of get a sense of the structure and, and what's in it. There's more details, so we won't go through all of it clearly, but um, this just kind of gives you the broad overview um, of this. Um, we start off by talking a little bit about the community voice approach, which is the methodology that we adapted for this process. This is a, a methodology that um, I was exposed to initially through um, work on environmental justice and urban environmental equity. The community voice approach centers the use of documentary video as part of a broader process of community engagement um, and um, also a process of geospatial mapping to basically understand what's going on in a community from diverse and multiple perspectives. Part of the idea behind the community voice approach and something that is really central is that um, in many cases, um, we may have different stakeholders who do not typically have the opportunity to engage with each other um, or are physically distant um, in such a way where they're not going to get together and have the type of conversation that might be useful, especially when it comes to understanding complex issues like community assets. And so the idea here is that documentary video becomes a way to link different community members together and different voices and conversations in the community together and to create a permanent record of what people are thinking and feeling and basically to put people in dialogue with each other even if they're not physically proximate to each other. So part of the relationship here is really about using the individual interviews to start to create conversations and then to use focus groups as a way to allow other individuals to react to their, their fellow community members and the different perspectives that they're hearing. And one of our goals for those focus groups is also to then record those conversations so that they could become included in subsequent cuts of that documentary video. And you'll see some examples of that that Emma is going to share in a few minutes. 
So through this iterative process that involves kind of traditional asset mapping, but then that also adds these components that are focused on documentary video and fostering community conversation, our overall goal was to create a living community asset map that has both these kind of traditional spatial features, but that also is um, kind of exemplified and represented through the voices and perspective and narrative of community members. We talked some about the overall tools and equipment that we use in order to achieve our goal. Um, we were very fortunate to have access to a, um, to a, a pretty good uh, documentary video uh, setup um, that allowed us to do some kind of more technical things with, uh, with our video. Uh, but to, um, one of our primary reflections is that, you know, anyone with a cell phone or access to Zoom could replicate the type of process that we did using those technologies that are readily available and accessible. And so we think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. In terms of the tools and equipment, we spend some time talking about, um, talking about that and talking about that there are some pretty low barriers to entry to replicating a process like this. And also I think some really important opportunities to take advantage of talents and perspectives in the community that might be interested in um, learning more about how to create documentary video or might you know, engage with this in other portions of their life, such as YouTube channels or, um, you know, or, or things like that, that you know, creates an opportunity to engage um, local community members in the process of narrative creating and working through the type of process for something like this. We talked some about how we identified stakeholders and I talked a little bit about the important role of our local advisory group in helping us to identify stakeholders and also the centrality in this case of University of Illinois Extension in helping us to identify uh, stakeholders. We relied heavily upon these groups as well as local institutions such as Art Par Art Arts Partners of Central Illinois in order to identify individuals uh, to, uh, to interview. And then of course, as we interviewed uh, people, we also asked them if they had people who they thought would be, um, would offer useful perspectives to interview. And so that's how we identified ultimately those 150 individuals who we talked with. Um, some of the lessons that we learned through this process was that it really did work well to start small with a core group of initial stakeholders and then to start to expand out from there through the conversations and as people learn more about the, the project. Um, we also thought it was really important to think beyond the usual folks that might be described as key stakeholders in the arts and creative community locally. And so that was really important to make sure as we were expanding out that conversation that other people were represented and uh, included. And again, to, to do this, our local advisory group was really important in helping us to think about the many spaces locally within Peoria where arts and creative activity might be occurring that might not show up within when you first think of um, arts and culture uh, locally. And we also found it was really important to have a very clear ask as to what we were asking people to do. Uh, you know, clearly asking people to sit down for a video interview is an ask that is maybe is a little bit intimidating for some. So having a clear sense for how this is going to contribute to this broader community conversation was really important for us to effectively engage our stakeholders in the process. Um, in terms of identifying community assets, we talked some about the technical process of asset mapping. And I'm going to kind of go over this just really very briefly because you're going to see more of this in action through Emma's portion of uh, the presentation. Um, we use uh, kind of traditional templates for community asset maps. And uh, in this case, we use ArcGIS story maps as a way to represent and publicly share some of those uh, traditional community assets. On top of that, we also relied heavily upon local government data. Um, we spent some time working with City of Peoria to file Freedom of Information Act requests for information like um, events permits and cultural permits and uh, neighborhood festivals to allow us to spatialize 
and map out some of those types of events as well. And so some of the lessons here were that this, um, starting with this kind of traditional asset mapping was an important way for us to develop a base story, a point of reference that would allow us to develop questions and understand as we're engaging people through our documentary video process and interviews to have a, a common point of reference for some of the things that they, they might be talking about. But we also felt it was important as we were going through that interview process to also go back and listen to what people were saying and think about other, uh, other things that we could add to that map. And so we grew the list and the, the list of things on the map based upon what we were hearing in our interviews. And we also thought it was important to share as we were going along so that we would oftentimes bring some of these preliminary asset mapping uh, products to interviews so that interviewees could respond to them or use them as a point of reference when they were talking about things that, um, you know, were, that when they were talking about their perspective on the local community. Um, in terms of our interviews and focus groups, I think they're going to speak for themselves. I'm going to really allow Emma to uh, focus on this process, but just some of the things that um, we really learned here. I think the, the, the bottom line takeaway is that people are incredibly generous with their stories and perspectives and uh, frankly had a lot to say, I think that was um, unexpected about the impact of arts and culture on their community. And I think you're going to, this is going, this point is going to speak for itself as you uh, see some of our video uh, products. But um, I think, you know, the reason to underscore this point is to say for all of the extra work and process that might go into an enhanced asset mapping process like this, um, I think there is something that is incredibly worth it with regards to the community development implications of doing that process and of reflecting the voices of community members back to each other to create a conversation that might not have been there in this form, um, but for the effect of the process. And so of course, uh, you can find all of, you can find both this community guide, you can find the asset map as well on our website. So I encourage you to dig into more detail uh, there um, as uh, after our, um, uh, after our presentation uh, today. Um, with that, I am going to turn things over to Emma and please forgive us as we spend a moment switching in between, uh, in between presenters here. And Emma will now share some more of the actual asset mapping, uh, asset map itself, um, as well as some of what came out of our documentary, um, our documentary video products. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm so excited to be able to share with you all today um, our final product, our asset map. Um, and I want to just first start with um, letting you know, kind of telling you a little bit more about why we chose um, ArcGIS Story Maps as our platform for this um, cultural asset map. Um, and that's because we wanted to include traditional aspects of an asset map, like maps. Um, but as Andrew and, and Jennifer both noted, um, we also wanted to incorporate multimedia storytelling. Uh, in order to be able to have local community members really be the storytellers of Peoria's arts and cultural assets, as well as the challenges and the visions. And so ArcGIS uh, Story Maps allows us to do that. It's a wonderful platform. So we can incorporate maps along with narrative, video, audio, and images. So our asset map starts off first with uh, just a brief overview of the project itself, a summary of our projects and goals, uh, and also a link to our community guide that Andrew just overviewed. Um, and then we jump right into the main themes of, um, of our interviews and what we heard from our community members. Um, we saw really truly um, an understanding of uh, assets and um, evolutionary forces, as well as community um, strengths and challenges. Um, but to start us off in the uh, asset map, we first uh, situate Peoria as a place. 
Um, our interviewees really focused on describing a real broad range of dynamics um, and factors that helped to make Peoria's arts and cultural ecosystem a really wonderful place. Um, and they mentioned things like cost of living. Um, it's an affordable place to live uh, and it's an affordable place to, to work and survive as an artist. Uh, and so we included some research takeaways here from um, some research that Dr. Greenlee did himself on the cost of living in Illinois, um, highlighting the affordability of central Illinois. Um, and then we also went into some information on the artist labor force. So the kinds of artists that work and uh, live in Peoria, as well as the kind of sectors um, that they are in. So this is just some, some general demographic information on uh, Peoria. And then importantly, we also decided to include kind of at the onset some, um, some context on historical dynamics. Um, a big uh, conversation that we had with um, participants throughout this process uh, was the impact on, of historical segregation on the arts and cultural community to this day. So not just Peoria as a whole, but specifically within the arts ecosystem. And so we included a map um, highlighting um, historical redlining uh, maps in Peoria uh, from the 1930s, um, and then showing how that um, has manifested in modern day spatial, uh, uh, spatial concentration of race and ethnicity. So you can see that uh, historically in places that were categorized as um, D or E or hazardous or declining, um, still to this day are um, spatially siloed, um, are concentrated um, uh, racially with generally communities of color. So in Pure, there's a real north-south divide that kind of mimics the historical redlining. Um, and this was brought up significantly in the ways that this historical uh, segregation manifested, again, in the sub-communities of arts and culture, but also manifested a, a spatial silo um, on the north and south sides. Um, so our folks, to start off with kind of assets, um, the folks that we talked to really um, highlighted a lot of the special things that make Peoria a great place to live, work, and play. Um, we don't really have enough time to show all of the video. We have hours and hours and hours of video content. Um, so I'm going to move through this section to save some time for more th thematic content below. But in this section, we have folks noting the reasons why Peoria is so special, from things like affordability that I've already touched on, to also the plethora of spaces and places that are available to them to practice and engage in. And you'll see this throughout the story map, but we have sliding video content. So we have multiple speakers here um, telling us a little bit more about Peoria. And then we move into kind of the traditional aspects of asset mapping. So this is mapping the places and the spaces and the people in Peoria that are related to the arts and cultural environment. Um, first up are places. So we um, mapped over 100 place-based assets, and these were identified through local data sets. Um, shout out to Arts Partners for sharing uh, their asset um, database with us, as well as IRS exempt organization database. Um, Local uh, data sets and conversations really showed us that arts and cultural assets were certainly seen as hyper-local, but also as regional. So reaching out to places like Bloomington Normal and Champaign County and Galesburg, although certainly it was really concentrated in the Peoria area itself. Um, but this kind of highlights and goes through all of those asset places. You can, um, as you scroll and, and um, click on certain things, you can see exactly where it is on the map as well as get their um, website to learn more information. And then we incorporate as well um, a map on events. Um, we, using um, public event data from the city of Peoria from 2017 to 2021, focusing on events that were creative or cultural, um, we identified 166 unique events that were held in Peoria. That's a lot of events, um, which is really wonderful. So we included this map to show um, you know, where they're, where they're happening. They're certainly concentrated in the downtown of Peoria, but are spread throughout the whole city, um, which is wonderful to see. And again, you can click on the dots to learn more about the event where it was held. Next up, um, folks really uh, engaged then in conversation about people that were assets. So people who were seen as change makers um, or you know, people that were making things happen and making the arts and culture community the thriving community that it is. Um, we've included some of these, you know, I guess we call them testimonials about these folks. 
Um, but we do like to emphasize again that you know that this is by no means an exhaustive list of all the people in Peoria that are really making thing ha things happen, um, but are you know these are a wonderful example of some of the um, the the great change makers in Peoria. So uh, this I'll show a video right now. This is Eileen and Doug Lunig um, talking about Nikki and Jonathan Romain. Most examples that we can point to is not ourselves, but uh, Nikki and Jonathan Romain. Um, who have, uh, by all practical purposes, created uh, a cultural center uh, where there were no cultural centers and um, are doing a great job of engaging the community, um, uh, mostly the underserved community, but the community as a whole supports them. And uh, they've had several fundraisers where all of the, uh, um, I like to say, the monkey mucks of, of Peoria, uh, go and support Art Inc. Um, but they've done this work um, strictly, well, not strictly, they, they have been the, the engine to, to make uh, this uh, Greeley School a, a past uh, a Peoria Public School building into a cultural center. Uh, they've gotten the money uh, from the community. They've, they've got the energy and people from the community to, to drive this forward. And I think that's that's a good example of how two individuals just decide they want to do this and and uh, so these videos focus on, again, so the, the Romains, um, we have someone speaking about Sarah Marie Dillard, who's um, a musician in the area, um, Bob Doucette speaking about Big Picture Initiative, uh, which is a, a, a really amazing organization in the area, um, Taryn Bradley speaking on a couple other organizations, and Gregory, uh, Gregory Wilson speaking on places like Peoria Art Guild, Peoria Guild of Black Artists, and more. So um, again, not an exhaustive list, but a great example of the many different players in Peoria that are really making things happen. Uh, next, we move on to collaborations. Um, this was really noted um, as a strong theme when reviewing the many hours of interview footage that we had. Uh, participants really noted uh, the many ways that the community worked together to make things happen. And it was one of the strengths of this ecosystem and something they all truly relied on. Um, so we have several folks here speaking on collaboration, um, but we're gonna hear from Bob Doucette. I was here the first year of the Big Picture Initiative they took one of my paintings that I had done of the Beatles. It was like a caricature of the Beatles and they made it into a paint by number made for uh, vinyl. And they had the whole community during this event paint on it. So you had little children, people in wheelchairs, people standing, people sitting, you know, like, and all painting this. And there was this great community feeling, uh, you know, of doing it together. And they were all excited to see how it worked out. And then when I showed up, because I, I, had, I had an appointment and I was late, but when I got there, they were like, the artist is here, the artist is here. And they were like, Bob, show us how to do this. You've got to fix Paul McCartney's eyes. <laughs> you know, it's really uh, very um, great feeling. So then just to finish that, cap that story, because it was a great one was uh, at the end of it, there was still a little bit of it left and we were, we felt bad that it hadn't been finished. So I contacted uh, the Lunigs and I said, Hey, uh, just let me know where I can get the paint and uh, Tom and I will come and we'll finish it on the weekend. And he said, no, you won't. We're going to have a painting party. And he put it out there and anyone who wants to come. So I thought no one's going to show up to this. There was like 30 people showed up just so that they could help us finish the, the mural. And then they were, they all took us out to Jimmy's Irish pub uh, after for lunch and for drinks. And it was just great community feeling. So with, with that, with the Lunigs, they're always coming up with new projects. So that's one of uh, the groups I like. Um, um, but see, it's like, I almost never say no to people here because I think, oh, this is going to be really interesting. What is going to happen next? Um, so again, this was um, this feeling of connectivity and community and collaboration um, was really highlighted in you know all of the interviews that we had. 
Um, moving on to evolutionary forces. Um, this is another theme um, that we found in all of our interviews uh, that really touches on the ways of the ecosystem, uh, the arts and cultural ecosystem in Peoria is changing. So the physical, social, spatial, and economic dynamics um, that really drive the artistic community. And this includes conversations on community strengths. Um, and these folks really touch on the uniqueness of Peoria um, and the different, um, the different aspects that make it the wonderful place it is. So here, here's Andrew Nui talking about some of the community strengths. Uh, if you look at it from an economic development perspective, I think um, there's a lot uh, that can be done through the arts. There's a lot of revitalization efforts that can be done through the arts. I believe it was in 2019, I set it on a, a presentation by Arts Partners of Central Illinois, and they had said that it grows on an annual basis, and this is dated, okay, this is data, uh, data, uh, revenue data, was 20 million just in the Peoria region for the arts, performing arts and all the varieties of, you know, what we define as art or creativity in our region, and so that's you. So in this section, we have uh, people like Andrew Nui talking about the incredible economic um, uh, vitality of the arts and cultural region uh, in Peoria, but also folks like Carrie Pierce and Emily Antonacci talking about the fact that there's a real lack of scarcity mindset, that people have lots of resources um, and places to access in order to thrive as an artist. Um, but of course, uh, just as there are community strengths, there are also challenges. Um, uh, within the community that community members and stakeholders are working to address. Um, these focused a lot on um, what we call silos. So the ways that there are disconnect between sub-communities and stakeholders within the community um, and a disconnect between the types of resources and networks that folks are able to access. And we'll get to the um, segregation in a second, but of course it focused a bit on, um, you know, that racial siloing um, that we that we spoke about at the beginning of the asset map, but also a disconnect between types of organizations and the kind of access that they have. So first I'm going to show a video from Destiny Wilson and she's focusing a little bit more on that organizational siloing. I think that um, it requires you know, it requires people coming in and creating space um, for those, you know, those new people to come in. And I think that there's also this, um, you really do have to have the respect of the community to, you know, take up space and, or for, for the space that you're taking up to matter. Um, and I think that we have we've come into contact with this a few times where when Bluffs was going super hot, we were having events like every every week. And, you know, we were walking around town posting flyers on bulletin boards and we were like posting Facebook events, you know, multiple times a week and trying really, really hard to like grow this. And um we kind of ran into this this thing where um, hard to explain, but um, foundations that are funded obviously have an easier path to tread than grassroots uh, like our house and bluffs, uh, where we don't have, you know, we don't have capital, we don't have, you know, funding, but um, where different different entities like arts partners or uh, bigger bigger arts and culture entities in Peoria, they have this sort of like freedom to, to make spaces that people respect because of their name and because of the, the funding that they have. Um, where it, it is a lot more work, like Alyssa said, it is a lot of work to, you know, try to make these spaces, whether it's like physical labor, like carrying things in, loading things in, or if it's just, you know, trying to carve out this, you know, space for people to pay attention to you um, and really give give what you're doing the respect it deserves. So, did. 
Uh, and to go back to the conversation of also racial siloing and segregation, um, that was not just occurring in um, in the you know artistic sub communities um, and within access to resources and attention, uh, but it is also happening in that spatial uh, in that um, north south disconnect. So um, you know a lot of perhaps programming and artist artist um, ecosystem development happening in the north side of the city, um, but not really connecting back to the south side. Um, and this uh, short clip from Reverend Irene Lewis Wimbley, um, who runs a community center in the south side, uh, really kind of uh, highlights that experience. I haven't really connected with any other artists and artist groups I know of, uh, just individuals that are in the community that and some youth that are just talented. We would love to get them connected with um, different uh, organizations. I don't honestly leave Southside enough to know who they even are. <laughs> so, um, I'd love to see the murals. Uh, we want to have some murals even in our building. Um, been trying to find a muralist for two years, I think, <laughs> looking at my sister, um, to, that we would to be inspired to come and put something on the walls. So far, no takers. Uh, and I do want to note that in talking about these challenges, um, I think that this is where our process of using iterative videos um, really shined. Um, as Andrew noted, uh, this specific methodology helped us to get um, people who often aren't in the same space uh, in communication and in dialogue with each other. And so in our focus groups, people were able to immediately react um, and come in real time, come to solutions or come to next steps about how to respond to things like these challenges, um, how to, you know, we saw folks respond to this kind of video clip and say, oh, I'm going to write that person's name down and I contact them. You know, I have artists in mind or I am an artist and I'm interested. And so to have um, different kinds of people from different places in the community and in different artistic sub communities um, be able to um, share perspectives through this multimedia project, um, I think was really powerful and has resulted hopefully in um, a lot of continued conversation and movement in Peoria. Uh, of course, impacts um, from COVID uh, uh, were, you know, a, a big barrier in the arts and cultural community. Um, you know, they noted not just the ways that it negatively impacted um, what they were doing, but there was a big focus as well on the way that the community had to adapt um, to COVID uh, and the way that it's led to kind of positive long-term changes in the kinds of programming that they provide. So there's just some, um, some pull quotes on that. And then we end um, with some visioning, some looking forward um, in what folks are hoping for uh, in the future. Um, I'm running out of time here, so I won't share too many more videos, but um, they focused a lot on equity and access to resources. So, um, you know, the need for more grants and more funding available to um, artistic programs and not just um, arts, uh, not just sciences, you know, in education specifically, or um, access and grant funding for a very different, um, a wider variety of types of organizations. And they also spoke about equity and space and representation. So uh, making sure that your boards, if you run an organization, um, are filled with folks that you might not think about, um, folks that you know aren't the easiest grab. So um, really kind of diversifying the folks that have a leadership position in um, Peoria. And then although uh, connectivity and collaboration was really seen as a strength, folks still were saying, I think we can do better. I think we can have even better collaboration and connection in our arts community. Um, and finally, we wanted to note on optimism. Um, again, although there are challenges and big barriers for folks in Peoria's arts ecosystem to overcome, um, there is an incredible amount of positivity about um, having the folks and having the resources to be able to achieve their goals and to overcome um, the challenges that they face. And then we end the story map with um, a really powerful clip from Sharon Reed, who's the director of Heritage Ensemble. Um, and she spoke, she's speaking on um, the, the importance of difficult conversations, especially in our current socio-political climate, um, her current status of hope, um, and the importance of never allowing the candle to go out. You know, a lot of people want to, okay, let me let me find this out. Let me listen to this and okay. 
I've got it, now I'm moving on. Stop and really begin to learn it, to have a deep appreciation for it, and be willing to sit down and have the tough conversations. You know, sit down and have the tough conversations. Because until you listen to me, and I listen to you, and I feel like I can be honest with you, and you with me, even if we don't like what we're hearing, are we going to make any progress? And I'm not sure we have that yet, especially now that we have <laughs> gone back uh, to less than being civil. And I guess the painful part of what we've gone through for the past few years in this country is I never really expected that people were rid of those things, but we were more civil. Now the incivility to man, I don't know how we're even going to get back to where we can have those conversations. So I think until we can find a platform led by people who will be appreciated in what they say and do and are able to talk to other people and we're able to sit around and share um, and feel good about what we're sharing, not good about the situation, but good about the fact that we have found our way to each other so that we can have these conversations. I don't know how much hope I have anymore. And that's a sadness for me. I just don't, I don't know how soon we'll get back there. So that's kind of, and I don't know if that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of where I am. You know, I want to feel like I can trust the people that I'm talking to. Not that as soon as I leave the room, oh, people take a deep breath or put those pieces of information that we found on the bottom of the pile. I don't know. I don't know. I, but I still believe that the arts um, people have a better chance of doing that than anybody else. I still believe that because uh, um, we cross all lines, we blur all lines, we, we, walk, we knock those walls down with our art. But then where do we go after that? So I'm not as hopeful as I would like to be quite honestly, but I'm not giving up. I'm going to keep on. There's a spiritual that says I'm going to work until my work is done. I'm going to work until my day is done. I'm going to work till the setting of the sun. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no tomorrow. Because I'm going to work until my day is done. And so that's who I am, that's who I've been, and that's who I will continue to be. I will not give up who I am to please somebody else. Not only am I going to be the person, I'm going to lead in those efforts as long as I can and as much as I can. And uh, that's what my children believe in their artwork as well. So there we are. Uh, and so that's how we close out our story map um, with that powerful statement from Sharon Reed, um, as well as some information on our process um, and our credits. But that is our story map. All right, I think at this point, um, we want to open up the, the floor for any uh, questions. Um, or reactions. I think we've got about eight minutes left, so I'd be happy to answer any questions that folks uh, might have about our process or the outcomes from it. Thank you, Andrew. I am, um, I'm going to use my um, 
my lucky position here that I'm in and just uh, put my question first. <laughs> so, and give everyone else, of course, a, an opportunity to um, get their question in the chat or raise their hand if you would like to be unmuted. Um, but I really love that last comment. Um, I think what she's getting at is, you know, that open conversations about race can help help those ingrained segregating situations. Um, that we experience in so many aspects of community life. And, um, you know, that can ensure that discrimination or just even the appearance of discrimination, um, whether it's, you know, directed or received as discrimination, that all that can be avoided. And, um, you know, thus mental health and security and social and economic participation can enable diverse outcomes. Um, in our arts and culture spaces, for example. So I really love her comments, but I, the question I pose to you all, and it's okay to, you know, guess, but like, when are those appropriate times to say, hey, uh, you know, this has to get done. So let's, let's talk about making sure we have equitable access for all. And like, what is our current situation in our arts and culture spaces or our economic activity spaces? Um, and in recognizing that we have so many ingrained segregation situations in so many communities, not just in Illinois, but in our nation. So um, feel free to just take that however you want and maybe give some thoughts and considerations for folks on the line. I, I, I can start and I, I I'm, uh, hope my other colleagues will, will also chime in. I, I think um, I think that um, Sharon Reed actually gives us a bit of a roadmap in, in some of her, her statements and, and talking about the potential for conversation and, and dialogue being an important starting place. I think, you know, one of the things that we saw through this process was that kind of embodied fragmentation. And, but I think also we saw that um, the process also elucidated to some folks in the community, especially those that um, might consider themselves having a strong influence within the arts and cultural institutional scene, um, that through this process, I think some folks saw blind, their own blind spots or things that they take for granted or, or things that, uh, you know, areas that they have not thought about with regards to engagement, communities they've not thought about with regards to engagement. And uh, so I think there's an opportunity there to start to kind of change some of those assumptions around who arts and arts stakeholders are or uh, how well the community is performing or engaging each other or where there might simply be um, multiple communities that over time have drifted apart and, and you know, kind of just uh, stay away from each other. So I think the, the starting place here is just helping to provide a structured understanding of what's going on and how different people are feeling about it. Um, you know, at the same time, our hope is also, you know, our engagement with local government stakeholders is that they also see that a stronger institutional responsibility to pick up some of the charge um, alongside uh, many of the uh, arts leaders uh, locally as well. So that's kind of what I see is that's what gives me hope, uh, maybe to boil it down. Um, as we conclude our contribution to this process. I think we saw evidence of people questioning their assumptions or questioning um, their sense of uh, the progress that had been made uh, within the, the community. Thank you. I want to give a chance for uh, my colleague, Mike, to put up the poll. Um, he's got a quick poll question on your knowledge gain uh, during this session. Uh, we'd love for you to respond to that. It just sort of lets us know that we were able to um, teach you something new. And so kind of reflects on where people are in their knowledge um, in terms of this topic. Um, and I see Angel's hand, and I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Angel, um, and let you... Uh, you're actually now able to unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Good morning. This is really exciting. It's like taking tourism to the next level. And um, I'm from Iroquois County 
and I do economic development here. And obviously we're a lot more rural than Peoria, but I really love some of the things that, um, that even as being rural, we can pull and, and apply it here. And I really like the GIS cultural mapping. I think um, doing the events, the the places, the testimonials and, and putting that all out there is right on key, right on spot. And I wanted to ask, um, I saw in, and obviously I'm gonna have to go back and look at all the videos and stuff like that, but you mentioned, um, and the ones that we saw were Zoom interviews. Um, but you also are doing, um, you said docu documentary video setup. You got a cool thing going on there. Can you tell us more about that? How how can a simple, you know, unskilled, well, we, we're all skilled in phones, but I mean, to be able to just use your phone and be able to make it look presentable, How I, I'm very curious on how that works. Thank you. Yes, and similarly, we had a question about the GIS mapping as well. And so you could maybe tackle those two questions at the same time, um, Emma or um, any of our presenters. Uh, I see a question about um, if there was a team working on the ARC GIS mapping um, or how many people and sort of what, like, what's that time commitment? So along with Angel's question that, you know, just kind of talking about what the capacity around that was. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, answer first. Um, so I guess to get to Angel's question, um, I think Andrew mentioned this um, in his discussion of the um, the process and the community guide. Um, you know, we did have a fancy camera, but they're certainly not necessary, right? Um, you know, we started this process where there are a bit more um, COVID restrictions. So we did do a lot of the interviews on Zoom. Um, and then when we were able to be in person, we did bring our documentary setup out um, to inter interview people. Um, but again, I think, as Andrew said, that you can use cell phones, um, any kind of um, process that helps, uh, that, that gets you to do the, the recording. And I think you can do it just in a simple audio form um, or video and audio. Um, but the real, you know, it's really nice to have the beautiful videos that we can have with that documentary setup. But I think the most important thing is that you're able to document people's stories in a way um, that allows you to share them um, and engage in conversation through it. So it doesn't have to be a fancy setup um, at all. Um, I think a cell phone, especially cell phones are so good nowadays that I think that could uh, work really wonderfully. Um, for the GIS question, um, it was mainly a, a team of, I think two that really, so me and um, another graduate student, uh, Chio Shu, um, kind of worked on setting that story map up. And um, the beauty of story maps again and online RGS is I think it's really user-friendly um, when compared to the usual desktop version of GIS. So, you know, I would say that making the maps themselves, you probably want some um, background or someone on the team who has some experience with working with GIS and making maps. Um, but when it comes to the story map itself, um, it really is super intuitive. Um, it's pretty easy to kind of incorporate the narrative, to plug in videos and um, imagery as well. Um, I think the most time consuming from my perspective um, was really kind of editing videos that had a little bit of a learning curve for me. But um, once you once you get comfortable with it, it's really just, uh, just the act of getting it done. But um, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question around um, that last comment, uh, um, the last uh, um, testimonial that was featured in the presentation today, uh, the reality of disparities and discrimination is heartbreaking. Are, are, where there, will there be funding up where, will there be funding available to begin making the hope for the future possible? And so if there's, do you, did you all maybe have um, any insight about local funding that um, you saw going on uh, to sort of tackle that, the, you know, the equitable access to opportunities, or, you know, I, I could even mention um, 
that last month we had a webinar around tourism that I think some of those funding opportunities that we included in the resources might transfer over to arts and um, equity and arts. So I'm happy to include that in the follow-up as well. Um, and any other comments on that or um, any responses from our presenters on that? Um, I don't think we can speak to any um, funds that were definitively received um, to, to our knowledge at the moment. Um, however, um, we are aware that several organizations that are network organizations in the area are utilizing these materials as inputs into their own strategic planning processes and as part of conversations that they are evolving. Um, what the outcomes of those conversations are, um, we haven't heard the most current um, conversations, but these have served as inputs to a number of conversations that are aware of for organizations um, or individuals who were moving um, various conversations along um, to help aid those conversations. Thank you. We have a great process question here. Um, and I love this question because we often see that you know, if something gets done in a community and other communities realize it and would like to try the same thing. And um, so there's a question about uh, what would be those first steps uh, to getting started doing something like this in our community. Things to be sure that we do, things to avoid, and those must have tools and resources. I'll start and ask my colleagues to add on. Um, certainly the local advisory group uh, was absolutely vital, um, as well as the ongoing conversations with extension colleagues at the very startup phase of this. We had quite an extended uh, initial planning and startup phase to really think about how far can we cast our own net to gain our best understanding as outsiders to the community? And how can we best communicate and be transparent as we are not residents of the area? We do not have lived experience or extensive lived experience in the area. So how can we um, both develop that network, uh, develop that trust, as well as communicate kind of what of our purposes as an outsider coming in to help usher and to uh, kind of be facilitators along in this process. Uh, so that was really important that a long, a fairly extended period for that initial communications to trusted stakeholders, the two stakeholders in the community about who we are building that trust and then demonstrating how we we're going to treat the stories and information and passions and challenges that they were sharing with us. So that iterative, um, the videoing and the iterative conversations really help build that trust al along the way. Um, so that was that's really important, I think, to have a fairly extended planning phase, that initial grounding of communications um, and setup and being accountable throughout the process. Andrew and Emma, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I'll just add something uh, quickly, but in regards to arts and culture, I think, um, what was important for me, especially in engaging in the, the conversations, was having as wide of a perspective as possible on what actually counts as arts and culture and not being the person who decides what counts, right? Um, so just being open to a really wide variety of what it means to be part of that community um, and trying to engage um, with folks as, as much as possible. You know, for example, in one of our interviews, it came up that they uh, work on cars a lot. And there's a car and coffee um, event that happens regularly in Peoria. So understanding that as an artistic expression as well. So that's kind of specific to arts and culture, but I think uh, in general is really important as um, outsiders coming in is just kind of being really open to having a variety of perspectives and understandings of, of who is involved. Thank you so much. It, um, it looks like we have, I know we have more questions. Now, um, there's a question on the computer program you, that is used to combine the videos and testimonials. Um, and Emma, you had mentioned that, that the answer to that is that you used Adobe Premiere to edit videos. Um, and uh, so, so that's really useful. Um, some folks find, Adobe Rush a little bit more user-friendly. It's like a sort of like a watered down version of Adobe Premiere Pro, which has a lot of bells and whistles, but then Adobe Rush can kind of be learned like in, in like a half an hour or something. So I uh, wanna thank everybody for joining us today. I 
don't see any other questions. Um, one comment about, yes, getting information about uh, the grants available. So yeah, I'll, I will share that document from last month's webinar on tourism. I think some of it really does overlap with um, the arts and culture project funding. Um, and so why don't we get just a few last words of takeaway from our presenters and, um, and then we'll let everyone go. Thanks so much for staying on with us after the hour. Well, I guess I, I can start off. Final word, thank you all for, for, for joining us. Um, we hope that this was useful and, and interesting. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, from, from my perspective, um, you know, this to me is kind of a, just yet another tool or another strategy in our community development toolkit um, to think about um, engagement. Um, but also to think about building a point of reference or an infrastructure that can be used um, moving on into uh, into the the, the future. Um, as important as we think the kind of outcomes are that we shared today, um, the process I think also really matters here. As within you know many of the the types of of things that that we do in this work, um, but the the process I think was really important in thinking about you know how things are going to move forward from here. And you know, I would just say, um, you know, it seems a little complex looking at some of the pieces, but uh, at least in my opinion, my takeaway has been it's absolutely been worth it um, for um, um, for spurring new and different conversations and ways of looking at arts and creativity in Peoria. Thank you. That's 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 my takeaway. That's hard to follow. Um, so again, I want to say thank you to everyone for the engagement, um, but certainly want to echo the, the commitment to the process um, and ensuring that, that you're able to help foster um, whenever feasible to really serve as almost as a, as a mirror in many ways, uh, kind of what you're hearing and be able to kind of bounce that back to engage additional stakeholders and those interested um, within the community. Um, so, so process is, is really important and what that requires is commitment and time um, and length of time and duration that which is part of that uh, trust building as well um, but it's certainly reveals um, very uh, useful connections um, and highlights different opportunities for different stakeholders yeah uh, thank you for coming today and um, it was really a, a special process and uh, not to to harp on the process again but um, I think as community development uh, folks and and planners, uh, we tend to be in a position where we are telling people's stories for them. Um, and I think the power of this process is that we're able to have community residents be the center of telling their own story um, and where we're just kind of playing a mediator. And I thought, I think it was a really powerful process to kind of remove ourselves even more fully um, to allow people to kind of share their own truths and their own stories and engage in dialogue. So it's a lot of work, but uh, it was a really special process. Thank you. We are very lucky um, here at Extension, but also as a state to just have this wonderful example um, of uh, such a nice participatory process and thoughtful process um, and have you all as resources. Thank you so much for your time and expertise talking about the project. And we're really looking forward to um, you know, getting that information out there and seeing what sort of comes of this. There there will be other sort of communities and individuals that will want to take this forward as well. And so um, looking forward for our next steps in collaboration, as well as um, any uh, exciting next steps to come. Uh, thank you all for um, what you do in your communities. And thanks again to our presenters. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their week.